has to get in the zone. You know. Well, howdy, 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 and welcome to the Real Faith Live Show. While the world is getting darker, Real Faith is getting a little hotter and a little brighter. Welcome to the 100th episode of the Real Faith Live Show! We are here in Scottsdale, Arizona, right off the Entertainment District, right off the 101. Um, we are here to, uh, what are we here to do, Nadia? We are here to give you a little show until the sermon is... <laughs> Definitely a show. <laughs> <laughs> We're just prepping you for the sermon that's coming at you in T-minus four minutes in 56 seconds. Exactly. And we'll tell you some really quick announcements between now and then, including an epic giveaway that you're not going to want to miss uh, or be a big mistake. Uh, <laughs> all right, so we are continuing our judges series by jumping into what character study? Samson. Samson was the guy that you should model your life after. Mm, I don't think so. Yeah, he did some really horrible things. Gives me some hope. <laughs> God uses anyone, literally anyone. Oh, okay. <laughs> Uh, it gives me hope for you, Nadia. Thank you. Um, last week, we had the pleasure of hearing Pastor R.T. Kendall. Uh, what an incredible sermon. That guy has a lot of energy for um, his stature. Mm-hmm. I heard that. I wish I didn't hear that, but I just heard that. Nadia, what was your takeaway? Well, I missed the sermon, but if you missed it like me, you can check it out on our YouTube channel. And if you're not already subscribed, do it now so you don't miss out on any of the great content we put out. But we're going to have to talk about your job later because it seems like it's your job to watch the sermon. So well, I'm a little uh -oh. concerned. <laughs> Somebody had to go. Um, <laughs> realfaith.com slash sermons, guys, if you want to check them out. Uh, and you can also email hello at realfaith if you want to apply for a job because we have one opening coming. I'll delete your application though. So. <laughs> well, <laughs> Our camera guy will make sure we get it because uh, <laughs> he'd prefer somebody that actually pays attention. Uh, this week, <laughs> Pastor Mark's back in the pulpit preaching on the life of Samson. Uh, despite his name meaning sunny, you'll learn that he's not all that bright. You have the right to remain. <laughs> Samson is one of the most paradoxical characters in the Bible. Um, Basically, God just uses him, and he does everything to make sure he doesn't get used by God, but God still uses him. Um, so, it's a really hopeful story. Uh, but buckle up and get ready to study one of the most interesting characters in the Bible. It's like if Donald Trump was in the Bible, is pretty much what we're jumping into today. So, um, he, uh, he does everything he shouldn't do. Uh -huh. He uh, likes quite a few different women, um, and uh, he makes, yeah, makes a lot of bad decisions. So, uh, if you want one of these study guides to learn about how Trump and Samson are very, very similar, go to realfaith.com slash partner. Um, hey, but God can use Samson, God can use Trump, unpopular opinion. Um, so I believe that. But go to realfaith.com slash partner and you guys can give a gift and you will get the handy dandy study guide. Here at Real Faith, we are seeing lives and legacies being changed nearly every day and we recently received a message that we wanted to share with you. Man, where do I begin? This podcast has changed my life. Pastor Mark is a dad I wish I had. I'm grateful for the spiritual father that he is to me. Pastor Mark's men's ministry taught me how to get over fear, confess my darkest sins to my wife. She's still safe, praise God. Take praise accountability and be the high priest in my home. God is working miracles through this ministry. The messages have healed my marriage, my soul, and deep wounds from my childhood abuse. So cool. I plan to make a trip soon so I can see real men live and hope to shake Pastor Mark's hand and thank him personally for the impact he's had in my life by just being an obedient servant of Jesus. What an awesome testimony and a great opportunity to be reminded about what an impact uh, praying with your spouse has. Real faith can only make impacts like this thanks to your generous support. Um, so whether you're giving or not yet giving, uh, we'd encourage you to jump on realfaith.com slash partner because the whole world needs to hear about Jesus and they need practically helpful teaching uh, in a world that is built on a throne of flies. Um, that's one of my favorite movie characters once said. Um, but, but for real, the world needs Jesus and we're trying to get everybody on the face of the earth to hear about Jesus. So 
Um, yeah, so thank you, thank you, thank you in advance. And we'd love to shake your hand, sir. Come on out. Um, go. At Real Faith, we love to practice for heaven, and we're pretty sure there are endless stakes in heaven. For sure. Sorry, Sorry vegans. Sorry to all the vegans out there. It's a little rough. Vegans um, don't go to heaven. I agree with that. Yeah. <laughs> This month, we will be giving away a meat subscription box. Vegans might go to heaven. I just want to clarify that. <laughs> but you're like, if you're if you're watching right now and you're vegan, just tune off. Yeah, bye. Anyways, so the winner will get 16 pounds of delicious, juicy meat curated by ButcherBox every six weeks for the rest of the entire year. I mean, there's a lot of other pastors these vegans could listen to. It's just probably not on our channel. I just want to clarify. Thank you for clarifying. But, yeah. <laughs> Anyways, imagine having all those steaks in your fridge uh, just in time for grilling season. It's going to be awesome. So get your dad shorts, get your long socks and your ugly shoes, and you're going to get a lot of meat delivered right to your house. And the way you can do that is text STEAK to 99383. That's STEAK to 99383. Without further ado, Nadia, what time is it? It's sermon time! Sermon time! You guys ready to study God's word? Yeah. Amen. Well, thank you. Thank you, thank you, thank you. Thank you for the love and support. I love you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Um, please, thank you. Please be seated. Um, I love you very much. I love you as well. And it's an honor to be your pastor. And I just wanna be an obedient servant and a decent son of my great heavenly father. And so today my assignment is to teach the Bible. Is that okay with you guys? Yeah. How about we do that? So if you would please open to Judges chapter 13. We've been in a book of the Bible called Judges uh, for about four months. And we've looked at a gal named uh, Deborah, fantastic anointed female leader. We saw a guy named Gideon. He started great, finished not so great. And, and today we're gonna to conclude our study in Judges looking at the most uh, complicated character, perhaps in the entire Bible, a guy named Samson. So let me tell you a little bit about Samson. Uh, he is one of the 12 judges. The book of Judges is a series of 12 judges. These are spiritual leaders that God raises up to lead God's people in a time that's much like our own culture. There's a lot of compromise, a lot of confusion, and the line between the church and the world has either been moved or erased altogether. And so God raises up the judges to make discerning decisions, like this is right, this is wrong, this is for God, this is against God. Uh, he is one of the most famous guys in the whole Bible. This guy, Samson, is. Even if you're not a Christian, you've probably heard of him. Uh, he also has made it into pop culture. And it's kind of weird, I was thinking about it. Uh, so there was a French grand opera called Samson and Delilah. It's weird that Samson made an opera. It doesn't seem like the genre, but anyways, uh, like I, I would see like death metal, like that seems like Samson, you know? Uh, but. Uh, he was, Samson was played by Placido Domingo. So he's, he's been even sort of a giant figure in culture. And uh, when we come to Judges, and I want you to read it for yourself, and I've got a study guide to help you learn it. Uh, he is covered in four chapters, 96 verses in the book of Judges. And that means that he gets more attention than anyone else in the book of Judges. What's also interesting about Samson, there's a chapter in the New Testament, Hebrews 11, and it has this list of all kind of the giants and heroes of the faith. It's like the Hebrew Mount Rushmore, like here's our founding fathers. And uh, of all the guys on the list, maybe the most perplexing is Samson. Uh, he actually made the list, but if you look at his life, uh, he is a man that doesn't make any moral progress. And most of the storylines in the Bible, some people meet the Lord and they make moral progress. For some people, it's two steps forward, one step back. For him, nothing. He starts as a guy with no character and 40 years later, he has not moved. 
I mean, the closest thing he seems to think the Trinity is, is alcohol, murder, and prostitutes. I mean, he's, he's really got some moral problems. And he's one of those guys that you're just, you keep turning the page thinking, okay, is he gonna apologize to God? Is he gonna get better? Is he gonna make improvements? And his life is very complicated because he is physically strong, but he's morally and spiritually weak. He's physically strong, but he's morally and spiritually weak. And the Bible says that he went to heaven, but ultimately he kind of lived like hell. And so he's one of these complex characters. Uh, One thing as well, let's just, I'll ask this. Do you think he was big or small? See, we all think big, but I don't know. I was thinking about this because, you know, it's my job. But, uh, <laughs> but I was wondering, like, was he a regular guy? But then when the anointing of God came on him, was he like the Hulk? Did he get big temporarily? Maybe, I don't know. Maybe he was a really big guy. Or maybe he was like another guy in the New Testament, a guy called the demoniac. And this was just a regular guy, but he was so powerful with demonic power that he literally lived out of town and people walked around that region. They avoided him altogether because he had superhuman strength. He would break shackles and he would kill people. We don't know, but nonetheless, when the anointing of God comes on him, he has incredible supernatural strength. What I find interesting as well, uh, some psychiatrists tried to diagnose him. And uh, I just can't see him laying on the couch talking about his feelings. But nonetheless, um, in the archives of general psychiatry, they diagnose him with APSD. um, And that is antisocial personality disorder. They look at the story of Samson in the Bible and they say he has antisocial personality disorder. So they give him a medical diagnosis, a clinical diagnosis. What's interesting as well, they say that uh, this mental condition is usually most prevalent in criminals and politicians. <laughs> I know, I was shocked too that those were two categories. I was like, I, didn't, I thought that was the same category. Uh, <laughs> And and what they said was to meet the clinical diagnosis, uh, there were seven different um, sort of checklist measures to determine who has this uh, dysfunction. And you only need three to qualify. He had six out of seven. Failure to conform to social norms, lying, fighting, bullying, impulsivity, cruelty to animals, and murder. He, He also never married. Uh, or he did marry, but he didn't really live with his wife. We'll get into that. Uh, He never had kids. Uh, He doesn't have any friends. He never assembles a team. He's a complete strong man, isolated loner. Now the backdrop for the life of Samson is in the days of the judges. And at the very end of the book, it tells us what was happening over this roughly 300 year course of human history. It says everyone did what was right in their own eyes. Everyone did what was right in their own eyes. And so you see the nation founded, and then by the days of Samson, everything has been in decline. And all of a sudden the nation is headed toward a cliff of ruin and disaster. And I was thinking about it from a prophetic standpoint, here we are in the United States of America, and let me just say this, the older I get, the more I love my country, and the more I don't love my government. I'll just say that, okay? so. But where, ju- where the story of Samson begins is roughly 250, 260 years into Israel's history, about the same age of the United States of America. So we're about as old today as they were at the beginning of the 40 year reign of Samson. And so what we see with Samson is this 40 year decline. And it makes you wonder as we look into our future, what does the future hold for us as a nation, as a culture, as a people? And so I I did a little research and I'll share it with you briefly. And this will set up the backdrop. It's the rise and fall of civilizations. It's from a Scottish philosopher named Alexander Tyler. And he says that most major countries, civilizations, they last roughly 200-ish years. And here's the process. And we see this in Judges. Step one, from bondage to spiritual growth because of suffering. They started in slavery in Egypt. Uh, Step two, from spiritual growth to great courage hardened by suffering. That was under the leadership of Moses and Joshua. From courage to liberty as evil is defeated. They got to take the promised land back. From liberty to abundance and prosperity, all of a sudden the economy was working and God was blessing. Step five, from abundancy to complacency and indifference. People stopped seeking God and they stopped thanking God and they stopped obeying God. Step six, from complacency to apathy and laziness. 
Next thing you know, evil's taken over the land, the culture is in decline, everything from education to entertainment, the government and the church is sort of lost its way. Step seven, from apathy, we don't care anymore, to dependence on government. And so all of a sudden it is, we don't depend on God, we need a bigger government. And then from dependence back to bondage. This is the cycle of nations. This is the cycle of judges. My question to you would be, where do you think we're at currently nationally? Somewhere a seven and eight. And that's exactly where they were. That's where in some regard, I think that the story of Samson is a bit prophetic. They're about as old as we are and they're about where we are. That being said, now we will uh, jump in. And let me just say this, um, the problems manifest themselves politically, but the ultimate problem is spiritually. In their day, they didn't obey and honor God. And the point is this, government can't fix spiritual problems. It can deal with the implications and complications, but ultimately it takes people turning from sin and trusting in God to fix the root problem because it's ultimately a God problem and it can't be fixed by a government. That being said, we'll jump right in. Judges 13.1. And here's the backdrop for the days of Samson. And the people of Israel, again, over and over and over, did what was evil. I'm sure they didn't use that word. Uh, I'm sure they thought, you know, well, this is our perspective. We disagree, tolerance, diversity, pride, you know, all of the nonsense. They did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. So the Lord gave them over to the hand of the Philistines for 40 years. And so what we see here is uh, what I will call the myth of progressivism. And that is that we're good and over time, just we'll get better. What we see here, over time, we're sinners and without repentance of sin and faith in God, things get worse. And how many of you right now, <laughs> you're, you're looking at our culture, our world and looking toward you know, what's coming with the election and you're like, can it get any worse? Okay, let me discourage you, it can. <laughs> it can always get worse, right? I mean, if people don't repent and trust in God, it only gets worse and worse. It doesn't get better and better. And so what they have here is they have an invading force called the Philistines that oppresses them for 40 years. That's the longest of any oppression in the days of the judges. And what's really interesting is at other times in the history of the book of Judges, they would sin against God. God would sort of lift his protection. Their enemies would invade and oppress them. And eventually dealing with all the pain, problem and peril, if you'll remember the people would cry out to the Lord. Finally, they'd be like, God, we're sorry. God, we apologize for what we've done. God, please forgive us. What's interesting here, it's the longest oppression and they never cry out to the Lord. The question is, how long will it take to cry out to the Lord? And let me say this, that sometimes sin in our life causes pain in our life. And as we're feeling that pain, the best thing we can do is cry out to the Lord as soon as possible. See, the God that we worship, his name is Jesus Christ. He lived without sin. He died for sinners. He rose to forgive sin. And he's right now alive and well in heaven. And if we cry out to him, I'm sorry, I've sinned. I repent, please forgive me. Every time, this is what's amazing about Jesus. Every time he says yes. And every time he then comes to help you and he comes to deliver you. They never cried out to him. What I think is beautiful, you'll see it in a moment, even though they don't cry out to him, Jesus comes to them. This just shows you that no matter how bad people are, Jesus is still good. In addition, the Philistines here are gonna be the enemy. So this is gonna be the conflict between Samson and God's people against the Philistines. So if you read it for yourself, and I would encourage you to do so, Judges 13, 14, 15, 16, these are the enemies. And all of this started back in the days of Joshua. So God's people were enslaved in Egypt. They were delivered. They were headed back toward the promised land after being displaced for 400 plus years. Joshua 13, three, if memory serves me correct, God tells Joshua, when you get there, get rid of the Philistines. They're your enemy, they're gonna be a problem, okay? And so the point is for you and I, what people and things do we need to not tolerate in our life? What are the people and things it's like, you know, we can't do life and business and marriage and family and relationship with them unless they repent because otherwise they're going to be a problem. Well, they never subdued the Philistines. And so then they had God's people and God's enemies sort of living and conducting business and marriage and life together. There wasn't a purity for God's people. And the result is judgment. 
And so I'll just read it again, and then I'll explain it to you. The people of Israel, again, did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. And what we would call this today is something called apostasy. And I wanna share with you this process that they fell into. And I wanna do so, honestly, with a broken heart. As I look at the Church of Jesus Christ in the United States of America, there are some wonderful, great, glorious, and good churches. Uh, but there is also this slide toward doing evil in the sight of the Lord. And it says, people are trying to do what is right in the sight of the culture rather than Christ. And at the end of the day, we don't give an account to culture, we give an account to Christ. And at the end of the day, we don't belong to culture, we belong to Christ. And so what we're seeing in our day is like in their day, the, the, the line between the world and the church, it was either moved or erased. All of a sudden the church is doing things that the world are doing. And so what God does, he sends consequence and judgment. And so let me show you the process that they were uh, suffering under. And I want you to pray, pray for our church and all churches that, that we would not fall into these four pillars of apostasy. But that's what was happening in their day. Number one, universalism. Everybody goes to heaven in the end. We all make it. Number two, pluralism. Well, there are many paths to God. Number three, syncretism. Uh, syncretism is Christians and churches remove God's lines between the church and the world and then apostasy. People who say they were Christians deny Christ in word or deed. The point is this, well, we're all going to heaven. Okay, so whatever works for you, pick your religion, your spirituality, just pick it. Um, and if you wanna combine some of that with Christianity, you can. And eventually most people will just decide, well, if we're all going to heaven and every path works, I'm certainly not gonna do what this book says because it has some very high expectations. And there's some things I wanna do and it tells me no. And it offends me, page after page. So if, if we're all gonna go to heaven and every path is right, and you don't have to do what's right in God's sight, you get to do what's right in your sight, then eventually what you say is, well, why would we read the Bible, pray and go to church? And why would we care about Jesus? He seems to expect us to repent of our sin. And that's what was happening in their day. And that's what happens in every day. And that's what's happening tragically in our day. And let me just say this as well. Let me say a few things and then I wanna get deeper into the storyline. There are lots of pressures on God's people, especially right now, to compromise, to not do what is right in the sight of the Lord. And they were doing evil in the sight of the Lord. Uh, let me say this, number one, for some of you, the great pressure to compromise is personal. And I love you and it's an honor to teach you the Bible. But let me just say this, we've all got some things in our life that are a personal struggle for us. We've all got our temptations. For some it's sex, some it's food, some it's power, some it's anger, some it's money. We've all got our struggle. But what you can't do is say, because this is something that I personally struggle with, I need God to edit his word, okay? And so just know this, Every single one of us at some point opens the Bible and says, if there was one thing I, would, I could change, that would be it for me. But none of us has a right to do that. We don't change what God says, we let what God says change what we do, okay? Number two, sometimes the pressure for compromise that they were enduring as well is relational. And this is where it gets very personal. There's somebody you love uh, but their life, their beliefs, their behavior, it's not for God, but you care about them. And so you wanna change the line of what God says so that you can, you can not lose relationship with them or not speak ill of them. I was dealing with a, a friend of mine some years ago and uh, he had this difficult moment. Uh, his dad died and was the grandpa to the grandchildren. And grandpa didn't care about Jesus, didn't care about church, didn't care about Bible, didn't wanna hear anything about God. Grandpa died. So then the grandkids asked dad, what happened to grandpa? It's, it's, it's tough, right? Like if you're just like purely a Bible nerd, you're like, uh, he's kindling. Yeah, but, but you know, but which may not, which is not the wrong answer, you know, but. <laughs> But you've also got the grandkids and they're crying and they're worried about grandpa. Do you see where now it's, it's a relational struggle. And so he, he gave them a good answer. He said, well, you know, grandpa didn't seem to care about Jesus, but um, that's between him and Jesus. Jesus is the Lord of heaven and he'll make the decision. He's like, well, that's, that's true. Like Jesus isn't down here going, hey, Mark, what do you think? 
I think you should make this decision. You know, that's what I think. So heaven belongs to Jesus and he decides what happens to people in the end. But you can't allow your personal struggles or your relational connections to change your convictions, okay? And then thirdly, as well, uh, cultural. So in that day, there was this overwhelming avalanche toward doing what God said not to do. Education, entertainment, even bad churches and government, all the pressure. How many of you, you do love Jesus, you're feeling it? Like right now, some of you are feeling it at work. Some of you are feeling it at school. Some of you are feeling it with extended family. Some of you are feeling it with friends. And that is God drew a line. We're asking you to either move it or erase it. Otherwise we're going to be a problem for you. And so the answer is, and I was praying about it a lot, and this is my uh, deep conviction. I told the team this this week. Um, I, I, I don't know, I should have looked this up. Um, is churchy a word? I don't know, it should be. If it's not a word, it's now a word. And what I think is that we just need to stay churchy. Okay, churchy, like, hey, open your Bible. Yep, okay. Hey, we like to sing worship songs to Jesus. We like to pray. We like to take communion. Uh, we like to build relationships. Uh, we get excited about weddings. When babies are born, we throw a party. Uh, we're those weirdos for Jesus. We're churchy. Amen. We're churchy. We're just churchy, okay? And so I just, I feel like the season that we're in and the word of God that we're studying, I feel like God's word to us is just stay churchy. Just do Bible and prayer and worship and Jesus and forgiveness and communion and life in the Holy Spirit and fun for kids and baptisms and weddings. Is that okay? Yeah. We're just gonna stay churchy. That's what we're gonna do. And I'll be honest with you too, I'm 53 and it's so hard to be cool. Um, so I just... I'm gonna stay in my lane. Okay, so what we're gonna do now, we're gonna jump back. So that's the backdrop of the story and the political, cultural, moral backdrop of the days of Judges and the days of Samson. Now we're gonna go deep into the narrative. We're gonna read a lot of verses and we're gonna look and peer into Samson's family. And the Bible says that faith comes by hearing the word of God. So I'm sure that your faith will be built as we read this together, but here's the story. There was a certain man of Zorah, Judges 13, two through 14, of the tribe of the Danites. Danite means judge, whose name was Manoah. His wife, her name is never mentioned. She was barren and had no children. Uh, and the angel of the Lord appeared to the woman and said to her, let me just tell you the surprise right now. That's Jesus. Jesus Christ is creator God, eternal. And here he comes down from heaven. Angel means messenger of the Lord or word of the Lord. When the Bible says an angel, it usually means a created divine being, an angel. When it says the angel, it's Jesus, the messenger of the Lord, okay? So Jesus comes down and the angel of the Lord appeared to the woman and said to her, behold, you are barren and have not born children, but you shall conceive and bear a son. It's a prophetic word. Therefore be careful and drink no wine or strong drink and eat nothing unclean for behold, you shall conceive and bear a son. No razor shall come upon his head, no haircuts. For the child shall be a Nazarite, I'll explain all that, to God from the womb, and he shall begin to save Israel from the hand of the Philistines. That's a military calling. Then the woman came and told her husband, a man of God, it is actually the God man, she was right, a man of God came to me and his appearance was like the appearance of the angel of God, very awesome. I did not ask him where he was from and he did not tell me his name. But he said to me, behold, you shall conceive and bear a son. So then drink no wine or strong drink and eat nothing unclean. For the child shall be a Nazarite to God from the womb to the day of his death. Then Manoah, the dad prayed to the Lord and said, you notice dad's not very sharp. God just told him what to do. And he's like, hey, Lord, what do you want us to do? It's like, well, okay. So Manoah prayed to the Lord and said, oh Lord, please let the man of God whom you sent come again, send Jesus back and teach us what we are to do with the child who will be born. God's like, okay, we'll do it again. And God listened to the voice of Manoah and the angel of God came again to the woman as she sat in the field, but Manoah, her husband was not with her. 
So the woman ran quickly and told her husband, behold, the man who came to me the other day has appeared to me. And Manoah rose and went after his wife and came to the man and said to him, now he's gonna to talk to Jesus. Are you the man who spoke to this woman? He said, I am. And Manoah said, now when your words come true, what is to be the child's manner of life? It's like, we've already been through this a few times. Uh, and what is his mission? Well, we've just covered that as well. He's gonna take a Nazarite vow and he's gonna fight the Philistines. And the angel of the Lord said to Manoah, of all that I have said to the woman, let her be careful. She may not eat of anything that comes from the vine, neither let her drink wine or strong drink or eat any unclean thing. All that I commanded her, let her observe. So here's his family. So there's Jesus, Jesus comes down. And what I love about this, they didn't invite him. Do you know that sometimes Jesus loves you so much that he just shows up and you didn't even know you needed him? Yeah. That's what happens. Did they really need Jesus? They don't know it and they're not asking him. He's like, I'm just gonna show up. Now what's interesting here, Jesus shows up, but the husband, he doesn't see it. Okay. How many of you women are like, I married that guy, right? Like, okay. um, it wasn't that funny, ladies. Uh, so, and sometimes what happens is Jesus shows up and you don't even recognize that God's now involved in your life. Okay, and that's what's happening here. But Jesus does show up and he shows up to hell. Now, the father, Manoah, um, he's a guy who, um, he's not that sharp. Jesus shows up and he's like, do this. And he's like, Jesus, would you please come back and tell us what to do? He's like, okay. The woman here is more mature and discerning than the man, okay? And I know that's never happened. It's really a rare exception here <laughs> in this section of God's word. Um, but what we see as well is that Jesus showed up once, told them what to do. The husband prayed, said, you could, come, could you please come back and tell us again? What does Jesus do? He does it again. Let me tell you what I love about our Lord Jesus. He's okay with the process. See, it's like raising a kid. How many of you have told a kid something once? Yeah, okay, you know where I'm going with this. Right? It's not like when they're four, you're like, okay, never, never, never do drugs or drink. And then at 18, you're like, I told you when you were four, you know, like we've already covered this. The truth is, if you're gonna raise a child, sometimes you gotta repeat yourself. Like, let me tell you again, let me explain it again. Here's what I love about Jesus. Um, he's willing to be in the process with us. He's like, I told you this, I'm gonna talk to you about it again. You know, we've already worked on this, we're gonna work on it again. Some of you feel bad or embarrassed or ashamed that you're in the process. And here's what I want you to know, Jesus is all about the process, all right? The husband here is in the process and Jesus doesn't rebuke him. Jesus doesn't shame him and Jesus doesn't neglect him. Jesus shows up and says, if you wanna do it again, I'll do it again. I'm committed to the process with you. In addition, the woman here, the, the mother, she's unnamed, we don't know her name. But their situation is pretty common in the Bible. So before this couple, there was another couple that was also barren. It was Abraham and Sarah. And then after this couple, there's another couple uh, called Zechariah and Elizabeth, and they were barren. And so barrenness in that day was devastating. It's really odd. Um, in our day, people generally in our culture don't seem to like children and they don't seem to celebrate life. Well, God's people are totally different. We celebrate life and we believe children are a blessing. That's what we believe. And so for them to not have a child, that would have been devastating. But then to hear you're gonna have a child, that would be a blessing. And uh, here's the bottom line for the parents. Um, they are believers, they do pray, they do worship God. Samson grows up in a, a good home. Now he ends up being just a wild man. And sometimes what happens is somebody grows up to just be a bit crazy and off kilter. And we wonder where did their parents go wrong? Okay. Sometimes it wasn't the parents, it was the person who just grew up and made their own decisions. Samson can't blame this on his parents. He can't be like, I had a lot of trauma as a child and you know, I've been through a lot. And they're like, we, Jesus was in our house. Like you, you had it pretty good, you know? And we, we stayed married and we loved the Lord and we worshiped the Lord and we prayed to the Lord and, and we honored God and we weren't perfect, but we were a godly family. See, sometimes what happens is we wanna blame the parents for the decisions of adult children. And just because there's a bad adult doesn't mean they had bad parents. They're responsible for their own choices. And that's the story of Samson. Well, a little bit about him. You may not know this. Uh, his name means sunny. 
and he's not very bright. That's Samson. (laughs) He also has a military calling to fight the the Philistines. Let me say this, God puts on some people uh, uh, an anointing for conflict, maybe even for combat. I do believe that there are certain people that God anoints and calls to be police officers and first responders and, and soldiers. And that's gonna be the calling on his life because evil doesn't stop itself. And so God's people need to get in the way and stop evil. That's, that's the calling on Samson's life. Now, one of the most important things to understand about his life, and Jesus says it here, is that he has something called a Nazarite vow. And again, all of this is in the study guide. And if you wanna look at it in detail, uh, in the Old Testament book of Numbers, which I know you were all digging into deeply all week, um, and thank you for doing so. But, um, but in the book of Numbers, chapter six is all about something called a Nazarite vow. And it's this unique vow of holiness. And holy means to be set apart or unique or consecrated and dedicated to the Lord's service. And so Samson was supposed to be uh, consecrated and dedicated from his mother's womb. That's why his mother was not to partake of alcohol and other things. Just to summarize it, the Nazarite vow on his life is four things, no alcohol. Does he violate that? Yes, okay. No unclean foods, does he violate that? Yes. Uh, No haircuts, does he violate that? Yeah, we'll get there. Uh, And he's not allowed to touch corpses, violated that. God said to him, four things, four things. And in his life, over and over and over, he violated every one of those four Nazarite vow commands. And what this is for you and I, you can be saved You can be a believer, but you can live a life without personal holiness. And so a lot of people will wonder, well, you know, am I gonna go to heaven when I die? If you believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, if you've turned from your sin and trusted in him, yes. But um, Christianity is not just about dying and going to heaven. It's also living for Jesus before you get there, okay? And so for Samson, we can look at him and we could be like, my goodness, this guy has some personal holiness issues that he really needs to work on. And we'll deal with this a little more at the end of the sermon, but it is a question for us. Do I, even if I am a believer and I belong to the Lord Jesus, do I have a commitment to personal holiness? A lot of people are like, well, I'm still gonna go to heaven. It's like, yeah, but don't live like hell on your way. Okay, and so it's this question, are we living in personal holiness? The story then continues. We'll read the next section, which again is a bit lengthy. It's a narrative. Judges 13, 15 through 23. Manoah said to the angel of the Lord, so dad says to Jesus, please let us detain you. Hang out with us and prepare a young goat for you. What I love about his dad, he grills. And so that's good. Uh, We all acknowledge that's a a great thing. And uh, thank you, sir. And the angel of the Lord said to Manoah, if you detain me, I will not eat of your food. Jesus is like, you know, I'm fine. Uh, But if you prepare a burnt offering, so that's worship, then offer it to the Lord. For Manoah did not know that he was the angel of the Lord. Jesus is at his house. And Manoah said to the angel of the Lord, what is your name? So that when your words come true, do you see now he's got faith. He's like, you said something and they're gonna, it's gonna happen. I believe in the word of the Lord. How do we know your name so that we may honor you when your promises come to pass? And the angel of the Lord said to him, why do you ask my name seeing it is wonderful? So Manoah took the young goat with the grain offering and offered on the rock to the Lord. So he's gonna sacrifice and worship to the one who works wonders. And Manoah and his wife were watching. And when the flame went up toward heaven from the altar, the, the angel of the Lord went up in the flame of the altar. He's like, oh my goodness, it's a miracle. I was meeting with God. Now Manoah and his wife were watching and they fell on their faces to the ground. Dear friend, what are they doing? They're worshiping God. And they're doing something that others weren't doing. They were living with a reverential fear of the Lord. See, other people didn't fear and honor and revere the Lord. Samson's parents do. Uh, The angel of the Lord, the story continues, appeared no more to Manoah and his wife. Then Manoah knew that he was the angel of the Lord, that was Jesus. And Manoah said to his wife, we shall surely die, we have seen God. So he's got definite fear of the Lord 
And technically in the Bible, if you saw God, you should die unless he was the one who caused it to happen. But his wife said to him, she's, she's pretty sharp. Um, it's good to have a gal like this, by the way. If the Lord had meant to kill us, he would have not accepted a burnt offering and a grain offering at our hands or show us all these things or now announce to us such things as these. Um, so here's the story. Um, Jesus shows up, Manoah wants to eat a meal with him. Uh, Jesus doesn't eat the meal. Instead, Jesus says, my name is wonderful. And if you know the scriptures, uh, every year you probably get a Christmas card that has a verse on it, Isaiah 9, 6. For to us, a child is born, to us, a son is given, and the government shall be upon his shoulder and his name shall be called Wonderful. So Jesus, let me say this. I, I, this isn't in my notes. This is just in my heart all of a sudden. Jesus is wonderful. He's wonderful. I've never met anyone like Jesus. A God that would love us even when we don't love him. A God that would forgive us even though we've not yet apologized to him and his kindness leads us to repentance. A God that would seek us when we're running from him. A God that would be patient with us in the process. Jesus Christ is wonderful. Can we, I just feel like we should, this is just in my heart. Um, would you just repeat after me? Jesus, Jesus you, are you are wonderful. wonderful. Doesn't that just feel good in the soul? Yeah. Amen. He's wonderful. He's wonderful. He's wonderful. I, I just am so touched in the spirit right now and how wonderful Jesus is. He's been so wonderful to me. Wonderful to my family. He's so wonderful. I didn't intend to say this, but I just feel like we just need to stop right now and just, just thank him for being wonderful. Just honor him for being wonderful and be grateful to him for being wonderful. Can we do that? He's wonderful. And, and what I love is they stop and they worship they make a sacrifice, they give an offering, and then they fall down on their faces. And in a bit, we're gonna spend time in the presence of Jesus, who is wonderful. And if you wanna, if you wanna be face down, be face down. If you wanna put your face in the chair and just meet with him and talk to him, he's wonderful. And sometimes you gotta just tell your body to show where your heart's at. When you bow down, you're saying, I, I surrender. When you lift your hands, you say, I surrender. They're worshiping. They're worshiping Jesus who is wonderful. And I love the fact here that the couple is, this just kind of hit me too. The couple is learning how to worship together. I just, just thought of this. Um, some of you, you've not worshiped much as a couple. You're married. You're like, well, we're kind of new to this. What do we do? Just get started, right? Uh, one of my favorite moments of the week um, is to come to church and I love you with all my heart. I am very honored to teach you the word of God. And, and I thank you for giving me the honor of being your pastor. Um, but before I preach, I get to hold Grace's hand in worship. If you're married, let me just tell you, you need that more than you think. And what we see here is this couple, they're worshiping Jesus together. Let me tell you what a blessing that is, okay? Jesus is wonderful and that is wonderful, okay? And so even when we go into our time of worship, if you're here and you're, and you're married, worship together. Yes. Hold hands, sing together, worship Jesus together, thank and honor him together. And I just love this beautiful picture of a, a couple that is worshiping Jesus together. Well, let me just uh, summarize a little bit on the story and then we'll go into some time to meet with Jesus and do what they did just to worship him because he's wonderful. So what we see here is the uh, beginning of Samson's anointing. So I'm gonna read you the next verse that closes chapter 13. And, um, and what we see is that the Holy Spirit comes on Samson in power at a very young age. And let me say this, children can have the Holy Spirit at a very young age. Sometimes the Spirit of God comes upon a child even from their mother's womb because they are a person known and loved by God. That's the case with John the baptizer. So what we see in these final verses is what sets Samson apart is the spirit of God anointing him for power, okay? 
And so we'll read that verse. And then I wanna look at the other occasions in the narrative of Samson where it talks about his powerful anointing in the spirit. Judges uh, 13, 24, and the woman bore a son and called his name Samson. And the young man grew and the Lord blessed him. That's the grace of God. Samson is saved and kept by the blessed grace of God. And the spirit of the Lord, the Holy Spirit, began to stir in him and Mahana Dan between Zorah and Eshtal. Chapter 14, six, the spirit of the Lord rushed upon him. Judges 14, 19, the spirit of the Lord rushed upon him. Judges 15, 14, you see this theme, the spirit of the Lord rushed upon him. Uh, let me explain how this uh, works, that Samson isn't constantly living over and over by the power of the Holy Spirit. He's grieving, quenching, resisting the Spirit, to use the language of the New Testament. But there are times when God the Holy Spirit falls on him, as God the Holy Spirit fell on Jesus in the early church, and I pray even falls on us today. And the Holy Spirit falls on him and gives him power. So what makes Samson powerful is that he lives by God's power. He doesn't do so consistently, but on these uh, intervals where the Spirit of God rushes upon him. Now, that being said, I'm gonna invite the band up at this time and we're gonna set the mood to do what his mother and father did in worship. And let me just summarize some themes from Judges. And I would encourage you to be reading these stories in God's word for yourself. But first and foremost, the, the, the entire theme of the book of Judges is not shockingly judging. Uh, there are 12 judges over the course of 300 years that God raises up to judge. You know why? Everything's wrong. And God says, somebody needs to say what's right and what's wrong, because not everything's right. And so this theme of judging is one in our culture that even people who don't know the Lord Jesus, they tend to quote one verse, thou shalt not judge. Let me tell you in context, Jesus said, uh, what he's saying is, don't judge them till you judge you. What he's saying is if you've got a plank, like a two by four in your head, and they've got a speck of dust, you should probably deal with them after you deal with you. And what Jesus is talking about in not judging is he's saying, judge yourself before you judge others, judge yourself before you judge the world. And so what we wanna do in this time together, we wanna say, okay, Lord, you set up judges to judge. And, I, and now what I'm asking is that we would spend some time and we would allow the Holy Spirit to be our judge and to show us any sin any uncleanness, any compromise, any rebellion, any doing what is evil in the sight of the Lord. And then as we repent and we say, Jesus, I'm sorry, please forgive me. You died for this and you'll, you'll forgive me. Then what'll happen is our sight will be clear. And then we can see ourselves, we can see our savior, and then we can help to have discernment in this broken and flawed world where everyone is only doing what is right in their own eyes. But again, before we start judging others, we gotta judge ourselves. Number two, one of the great themes from the story of Samson is eyes. Over and over in the book, it says that everyone did what was right in their own eyes. Samson, on one occasion, the Holy Spirit reminds me, they ask him, why are you doing this? He said, seems good in my eyes. The key is you need to do what's right in God's eyes. We read at the beginning of the Samson narrative, everyone did what was wrong or evil in the sight of the Lord. It doesn't matter how I see it, whatever the issue might be. It doesn't matter how they see it, whatever the issue may be. Really the issue is how does he see it? How does he see it? And what's interesting is that Samson lives his life largely morally blind. And at the end, he actually goes blind. And the point is this, we don't wanna live blind. We wanna live with our eyes open. That means that we need to begin by judging ourselves so that our eyes can be open, not just to the evil around us, but the rebellion in us. And let me say this, dear friend, I love you very, very much. And I'm gonna apply this word to my own life as well. But we live in a day when you can get so upset and angry about everything that's going on out there, you don't take time to see what's going on in here. Yeah, the world is dark, how about me? Yeah, the world is foolish, how about me? Yes, the world is rebellious, but how about me? And so we're gonna use this as a sacred time for you to invite the Holy Spirit to be your judge. 
for God to open your eyes to anything that would be displeasing in his sight. And then we're gonna ask the Holy Spirit, and I would encourage you to ask the Holy Spirit to anoint you with power, like Samson had. And ultimately, what we see in Samson, there's a big difference between power and character. He has unprecedented power, but he has poor character. This is true of many Christians. They have great power, but they don't cultivate character. And so I want this to be a time for us as a church family and you as individuals to ask the Holy Spirit, not to just give you power, but then to agree with the Holy Spirit that you would use that power to cultivate character, the fruit of the Spirit, not just the power of the Spirit. See, the fruit of the Spirit is love, joy, peace, patience, goodness, kindness, gentleness, faithfulness, and self-control. That's the fruit of the Spirit. Samson had the power of the Spirit, but he didn't cultivate the fruit of the Spirit, Christian character. And lastly, I will close with this. He had a Nazarite vow on his life. And that was God saying, son, these things are not for you. These are things in the world, they can't be in the church. These are things for the unbelievers and they can't be for the believers. And my question to you, dear friend is, how is your personal holiness going? When no one's looking, God still sees. As there are areas of your life, you're like, well, I'm not doing what I should be doing, but I'm not as bad as them. Well, it's not about you and them, it's about you and him. So I just feel inclined in the spirit based upon the word of God that we've studied today, that uh, this sermon's gonna end a little early. We're gonna take time to be churchy. We're gonna sing, we're gonna pray. We're gonna repent of our sins. If you've offended someone and they're here, reconcile with them. Uh, If you need to kneel and fall down as this beautiful couple did to worship God, do so. Uh, If you're married, uh, hold hands and worship like they did. And I just feel like that's all I need to say today. I love you with all my heart. Let me pray for you. And then let's just meet with Jesus who's wonderful, okay? Lord Jesus, we just say you are wonderful. You've always been wonderful. You will always be wonderful. You can only be wonderful. Jesus, you came down to this couple and they didn't ask. Jesus, we're asking, please send down your spirit, the spirit of Christ. God, as you anointed Samson, we ask that you would anoint us with power. But that Lord God, we would respond not just with the power of the spirit, but the fruit of the spirit, that we would cultivate Christian character. And Lord, as the world gets darker, we ask that we would have short accounts with you, that we would close that time gap between our sin and our repentance and that you would continually pour out grace on us as you always do. And Holy Spirit, we just invite you now. Uh, God, Lord Jesus, this is your church. These are your people. And this is their time to meet with you. And so we thank you, Lord Jesus, for your presence. And we pray all of this in Jesus' name. Amen. Please stand.